<coughs> and also all the young falcons were successful because if they weren't successful we'd just keep going gently building their confidence until they were successful um, but we quite enjoyed doing that that was quite good fun so we we started having competitions then and we developed a competition uh, where the falcon chases the thing into the sky and then stoops and so on and uh, then we also bought a farm called Rowley in Wiltshire and um, used the farm for training and we ran our first competitive event there in September 2019 um, and various people came with their falcons and we all had a very nice day, the sun shone um, so we plan to do more training and competitions at Bowley. Of course, flying at the robotic prey is not real falconry. It's not hunting wild prey. With my crow falcons, I normally keep a team of six to eight crow falcons. Um, on a hunting day with the horses, that'll be maybe three days a week. Then for the other three days of the week, We'll fly them at robotic, at road crows, and then maybe one day a week they'll have the day off. Um, so that keeps my falcons, gets them fitter than they used to be, and they can hunt both quarries, because we want the falcons to be good for hunting, not just for racing. Um, but we have enjoyed the racing and it means that a lot of people can fly big falcons at prey in southern England in country which you couldn't realistically properly hawk in. You just can't, there's too many trees and pigeons and things. But with the row prey the falcon gets locked onto the prey and it'll use the same patch of sky where you are and come down in a set place. So you can enjoy good flights without a lot of the stress that we have when we're actually hawking. In the year 2005 you uh, became one of the founders of the Falconer Heritage Trust and then became chairman of the board. <coughs> Could you please tell a little bit about program of grants which are available from this trust? So we formed the Falconry Heritage Trust and Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed donated a million pound towards an endowment fund which has enabled us to function um, and um, at the same, uh, that, uh, that fund now employs Yevgeny as an archivist but it also provides scholarships for people to do um, to, to write uh, translations, books, reports, PhD theses and so on, on some aspect of falconry heritage. At that same time, in 2003, um, UNESCO signed um, a new convention on intangible cultural heritage and Abu Dhabi government um, employed me to prepare a submission on behalf of falconry as intangible cultural heritage. So we held a series of meetings in different countries. I think we started off with about 22 countries and to, to make a submission there's various things that the country has to go to and sign. But we ended up with the first submission I think was 11 countries, is that right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We submitted that and in 2010 um, our inscription was successful in Nairobi um, on behalf of those 11 countries and since then I think seven more countries have also been included. Um, and to do that we had to produce a book and a film and I, I wrote the main text of the submission and it had to be written in such a way that it would fit all the nations of the world not just one culture and it would also work for 
future falconers, not just the current ones. And um, one thing I learnt from going to all of those conferences for the UNESCO was that while history is about the past, heritage is about the future. Heritage is about what we pass on to our children. It's a living heritage. And it's quite difficult to preserve a living heritage. It can evolve. For example, our robotic prayer uh, have evolved from falconry. We're not trying to preserve it as it was in any set period of time. At the same time as doing that, I don't know why, but I must have woken up one morning and thought it would be a good idea if we did a festival of falconry. And we hired an estate called Englefield near Reading in England and we invited, was it about 65 yes. nations then? We raised money for flights and we had a two or three day festival event there in 2007 uh, with lots of falcons and hawks and eagles and horses and national dress and so on. We did another one in 2009 at Englefield and then the Arabs wanted us to do another one in Abu Dhabi. We did that in 2011 near Al Ain and another one in 2014 based at in the western region of Abu Dhabi and then uh, at Al Fasan in, in Abu Dhabi city. <clears throat> I'm not doing festivals anymore at the moment. I think um, I've probably done enough festivals for one lifetime. <laughs> we ended up with 80 nations <clears throat> and it was all getting a bit. I mean, my shopping list was two dozen golden eagles, 80 camels, a dozen horses. I brought 30 something of our own falcons over. Our team was about 30 people. Um, so it was getting to be quite a logistical headache, really. <clears throat> um, Together with your wife, Barbara, you have in program of internship for the last 30 years. Could you tell a little bit about <coughs> interns? Yeah, for the last 30, 35 years, we've we have interns coming in the summertime, mainly breeding season, to help with breeding the falcons. Um, we're below our peak at the moment, but when we're in full breeding capacity, we breed about 280 falcons a year. And we normally have three to five interns come every year, bringing the staff up to about 20 in total. And... Um, they come and learn about breeding. <laughs> then quite a few of them go away and establish their own breeding projects. So now a lot of the breeding projects in Western Europe and in UK are from ex-staff or students from here. Um, we also formed um, the Bevis Trust, which is a conservation um, organization based here on the farm. The farm currently is about 300 acres and um, it's to do with promoting um, wildlife biodiversity within the context of sustainable agriculture. So for example the last five or six years we've been breeding beavers. We have three families of beavers on the farm, water voles, we've got white stalks, um, we've planted, I think last year we planted about 18,000 trees. <clears throat> For the last 30 years I've tried to plant on average about two trees a day, every day of my life. <clears throat> some of that is hedgerow trees, some of it is big trees, and the bigger trees now I'm felling and milling for timber to make my beaver watching hides with. <clears throat> um, beavers? Beavers. Uh, so now we're, 
the, the politics of beavers is complicated. Now we have the whole rewilding and climate change thing going on. We found that we were about 30 years ahead of the curve on all of this because we've been doing it for years and years. And the farm is, has solar um, electricity um, and geothermal heating and so on. Um, yeah, so we're very interested in that. And then the last three years I've been, <clears throat> I've been writing a book on morality, which includes the morality of hunting ethics and um, land use ethics. That book is, is just about finished, but I, I keep tweaking it. I'll submit it to the publishers next spring time, I think. Um, so yeah, that's kept me very busy. Uh, we've also um, done quite a lot of filming, but we're not filming so much now. Um, in this digital age, the economics of making films is no good. People rip off your films all the time, especially the Russians. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, another of my interests is designing houses. I design... I've designed quite a lot of houses and buildings and um, I like to have turf roofs on some of the buildings. I also design hoods and I design saddles for horses. Uh, normally we keep five or six horses. My oldest horse at the moment, Buckskin, will be 30 next month. It will be, he'll be 30 next month, I'll be 70 next month. So we're going to celebrate our joint centennial. I have heard that you like to dig pits under lakes and ponds. Oh, uh, yeah. I've dug about 30, no, not 30, maybe 25 ponds, because the beavers have dug another 10 or so. The biggest is 350 metres long, and... If you look on the Bevis Trust website, you can see pictures of some of them. And then they, once you've dug them, you've got to get all of the right plants growing. Then the birds and wildlife come. And then sometimes at night I go out with a night vision scope and I can see the hedgehogs and the birds roosting in the trees and the waterfowl roosting on the water with white heads from the heat of the heads and the beavers across the water like that. Um, that's about it, really. What are your wishes to young generation, to youth who would like to become falconer? Which features of character and nature they should have? My main problem with the young people is that <clears throat> um, a lot of them lack focus and concentration. Falconry is all about details. If you don't pay attention to the details, things can go wrong very quickly. And you've got to focus and pay attention the whole way through. You've also got to have empathy with the animals, obviously, but because people are using their phones and internet and everything so quick and instantaneous, the concentration isn't there like it used to be. For example, <clears throat> the staff and the young people, <clears throat> very few of them will read falconry books. Even if you give them a pile of falconry books relevant to this, what they're actually doing, they'll look through it, but they can't, a lot of them just cannot read through it. You've got to make them films or pictures, something quick, because that's one of the problems. <clears throat> um, I expect all older people moan about the younger generation, but you do, if you're going to be a good falconer, you've got to be dedicated to it. 365 days of the year, 24-7, and if you're not, you'll never be a good falconer. Does it matter, as long as you enjoy it? No, it doesn't. You don't have to catch anything with your bird if you don't want to. 
Equally, you could as well just have a parrot. Or better still, a stuffed parrot. <laughs> Depends what you want. But for me, I like to go hawking with, with friends on the horses and have a good gallop and see some good flights and get rid of cars and motorways and towns and cities and people. Yeah. With the falconry we do, we use like the GPS tags, we'll use walkie-talkies, we have to have a hawking van. So we'll use modern technology because we need to, but no more than we need to. <clears throat> Still, Horses are horses, and falcons are falcons, and crows are crows. You can still fall off a horse, whatever technology. So we've had a lot of people break a lot of bones. I've broken quite a few myself. And we collect for the air ambulance. We collected £1,400 this season for the air ambulance. And we hope that we don't need to call it out. But we've had broken shoulders, broken backs, collar bones, things like that. Yeah. Not very optimistic <laughs> end. <laughs> no, I think it's great as long as it's somebody else. <laughs> When it's me, I broke my pelvis and oh, even now, about eight or ten years later, it still twinges in the cold weather. Yeah. Thank you very much for your very interesting interview. Thank you.